You're watching Pegarai TV, Rhode Island's public access channel. Hello and welcome to another edition of Poets and Poems. We have somebody super special here. We've never had uh, someone like this particular poet. His name is DeMont Combs and he is the Poet of the Year 2018 for the entire United States. So this is very special to have him with us today. I would like to introduce you. Hello DeMont, how are you? How are you doing today? Good, good. And um, wow, you have your award there, and I don't know if anybody can, you know, can take a quick picture of that. Um, could you tell me a little bit about right away what is that award? What makes you poet of the year? Uh, the Indie Author Legacy Award. Uh, I'm two, I have two poetry books out: my poem, my riddle, a touch of orange, and I won the award based on book reviews, community work, and media exposure. Wow, that's wonderful, wonderful. Now, uh, I wanted to know, really, whenever I talk to a poet um, that I, you know, I, you have gone to the Lively Literati uh, that, I, that I host um, in Cranston, uh, which is on the uh, last Thursday of every month. Uh, we have it between 6.30 and 8 and in Broad Street at the Shasti. And you came into some of your poems, you were on the open mic. Next month, you're going to be our feature author. Yes, yes. And yes. Um, I always want to know, like, how did you get started in poetry? Like, you know, I just spoke to you before and you said, well, I did start when I was very young. You were a child. So what made you get that first poem out? What, what sparked your, your start? Ironically, as being a writer uh, and a poet, you have to write. And my handwriting going to school was just atrociously horrible to the point where <laughs> teachers couldn't read it. So the, the teacher, uh, ever since I was in elementary school, was just like, the only way to cure this is to write more. So I began to write a lot more. It started with stories, and then my, my ability to focus was a little uh, waning. So poetry became the go-to method for writing because it was a shorter, concise uh, thought process for right. me. So what would you start writing about as a little boy? What would like, get you going? I started mostly, I wouldn't say a little boy. I mostly started maybe around the age 14. Mm -hmm. I uh, went online and uh, just wrote little silly poems. Like one of the first ones I remember writing was about my MP3 player. It died. <laughs> I wrote this little funny poem. And yeah. it was ironic because I actually started putting my poetry online. And uh, it was called poemsandquotes.com. And I put my poetry on it and it, and, I, and it would get rated. And I would get bad ratings at first. So then I oh. said, wait a minute. I don't like to get bad ratings. Right. <laughs> so I was like, let me research this. And then I found out there's a whole bunch of different types of poetry. There's a whole format to this. And it just, as soon as I learned all of that, I just went full blown in and just started yeah. writing way more, trying to improve my rating. And little before I knew it, uh, I had a lot of poetry. And um, that's what a lot of the poetry you'll see in this book. Mm -hmm. My first book, my poem, my riddle, that's what you're going to see in there. I see. And how does this is the book right here, my poem, my riddle. Um, and what, why the name my riddle? Uh, it's based off of a poem that I wrote. Okay. And it's a poem and a riddle and a story. I see. It, I see. So now a lot of times people say when they, you know, when they become writers, one of the things that they have is inspirations of other writers. Was there anyone that really hit you when you were younger that you, that just kind of like when you read their stuff, you're like, oh, I want to write like that, or oh my gosh, this really f fires me up. Is there, do you have a mentor of some kind that you read and learned from? Um, for me, starting out, it was a lot of my friends, and then when I went online, I was just open to this whole world of poetry, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, Shakespeare, uh, 
uh, Langston Hughes, mm -hmm. you know, all, all the all the greats. I like to call them the greats. Yeah. Then more modern ones at the time, uh, Def Jam Poetry just came out, yep, so yep. I was I watched the, all of that, and uh, performance poetry became a thing. And my friends also, some of my friends wrote poetry, and um, so I started really just diving into it on top of doing technology at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's unusual. We haven't found it. We haven't had a lot of people on the show that started online. Do you know what I mean? That would mm. actually go out there and take the risk even when you're first getting started. And I think it's probably a generational thing because many of the poets we've had are older poets. Some mm. of them don't use online at all and never did. So in your case, um, you really started by doing um, live performance. You were, do were you doing open mics or, now you lived in New York, is that correct? Yes. So were you finding places to go to open mics or places where you could actually perform your poetry? At that time, no. When I was, uh, yeah, yes and no. Okay. So I was in high school when I first started really, really writing poetry. And <clears throat> when I started putting it online, I was just mostly doing it online, writing it, keeping a whole bunch of notebooks and everything. And, and then I went on to college. And it's when I went to college that I said, uh, uh, I joined the organization there and I actually wrote a call, the documentation of their being. I actually joined and put my book in there. Mm -hmm. So in all technical purposes, I did one anth I'm a part of one anthology. Oh, good. Wow. Um, I don't have that book on me. Mm -hmm. uh, so then when I went over to Providence, Rhode Island, at Johnson Wills University, mm -hmm. and I went on to college, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have that outlet anymore. Uh, access to internet to me was, wasn't fulfilling that family need. I needed a, a family. So what I did was I went out and I started doing poetry live. And I went to Blue State. And I did Blue State, which was on Thayer Street every Tuesday. Okay. And I got to learn uh, a lot of poetry there, like performance-wise. I didn't really blossom. I did that for a couple of years and then I went over to Cafe Soul. When I went over to Ca Cafe Soul, that atmosphere uh, run by Contessa Brown and Mama Brown, uh, that atmosphere completely changed and revolutionized the way I performed because it gave, it made me comfortable to perform. Okay. Blue State was very, very rigid uh, performance-wise because you had poets that were doing it for 20 and 30 wow. years. Wow, yeah. So like all around you. So I had a wealth yeah. of experience. But when, you can, when you're on stage with that, it's, it's a big difference versus when you're in a small, nice, dark-lit room where the microphone is you know, a small, intimate crowd. Right. Like so that, these that were open me. mics, is that what you're saying? That they yes, were, I, okay. I, I love open mics. Yeah. I love open you mics. You said there was much more of them back then than there are now. Oh, uh, yeah, there was at least 13 at any given time, uh, maybe roughly around 2012, 2010. Mm -hmm. You had Black Repertoire Theater, you had uh, Blue State, you had The Spot, you had The Underground, you had Cafe Soul, mm -hmm. and the list goes on and on. You had right. uh, From the Rip, which was run by Jay Chattel at the time, and a lot of the poetry and the open mic scene, the businesses themselves would close. And every time right. a business would close, you have to find a new open mic. Mm -hmm. And we had to find a new open mic, which means that the person that's running it would have to restart online, right. the, the flyers, like it's a whole business that literally has to start back up from the ground. So right. when that kept happening, Someone didn't pick up the mantle, life goes on, mm -hmm. and then you have now where there's almost no poet open mics consistently. Right. You're talking about something that's monthly, you can depend on it. Yeah, yeah. even yeah. weekly. Like those, the ones that I'm talking about were actually weekly, like literally every wow. single week or mm -hmm. every other week. Yeah. Now you have ones that are popping up here and there that are maybe once a month. The only right. one that really isn't comp open right now that does it a certain way is AS220, and that's right. because they're nonprofit. They get funds from the government. Right, right. So you were, also you were probably encouraged to have, when performance poetry, to memorize your poetry, right? Or did you just do that because it was natural to you? Is it easy for you to memorize, or? Uh, I, ironically, uh, one of the poets at Blue State, Eunice Kadu, uh, shout out to him. He, he's a very amazing poet and actor now, mm. successful. Um, he, he taught me a lot. Um, among, you know, Christopher Johnson, poet mm -hmm. Laureate of Providence, Jay Chattel, poet, uh, yeah. Pawtucket, you know, poet, they, they, they all had memorized pieces, but Eunice, uh, he told me to memorize 10 poems oh, okay. at any given time. So when yeah. people want you to perform, you can perform for them. Right. So I, that, that was a task, that was an undertaking. It took me a while, but I did it. 
Christopher Johnson has uh, a 30 for 30. Wow. That's yeah. 30 poems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At any given time. Right. <laughs> That's amazing. So you started to do, your t um, you told me that you started, once you started to do the work, you created a second book called A Touch of Orange. Yes. And you're known now as Mr. Orange. So I'd like you to explain that because that's one of the poems that you're going to be performing. Yes. Um, so what ended up happening was I went over to Blue State and I would go there a lot and they would just see me wear orange. So one day, uh, I think it was actually Eunice that gave me the moniker Mr. Orange. He started calling me that and then it stuck. Um, the way my first book came about, I was supposed to perform at an event and it was a requirement to have a book published. I see. So I published the book with Prasmatic Dreams, one of my friends named Tribal who also went to uh, Blue State mm -hmm. and Max. Uh, they have, uh, I, I did the book and I'm like, I didn't even go to the event, so I just have this book. <laughs> I'm like, what do I do? And now it was like, all right, I'm an author. So uh, I went out to the community and I tried to put it in the bookstores. And I got a whole bunch of notes. Finally, I think it was Ada's bookstore that told me yes. And then I went back to all the bookstores that told me no. And I re-requested them to put, put it in, and then they said yes. Wow. So it, it was a, it's an amazing, amazing journey of just persistence, yeah. persistence. Well, I want to take a break right now and have that poem that you wrote, A Touch of Orange. I'm going to have you do some on the podium in, for a few minutes. Of course. So this poem that I'll be performing is called Orange. It's uh, actually named after the name of my second book, A Touch of Orange. If you uh, notice, if you get to know me, which you will, um, when I go through the community and everyone sees me around, I'm always wearing orange, which is why I got the moniker Mr. Orange. So I'm going to need you guys' help today. Anytime I raise my hand like this, I want you guys to help me out and say orange as loud as you can at home. Ready? Let's try it out. One, two, three. Orange. There you go. There you go. All right. One, two, three. Orange. Plasmatic flames rise above all else, consuming as is the most beautiful sight above all else, to the dawning of the sun, to the rising of the morning, to the burning of all things burning. Orange. Camouflage in the wilderness, life depends on it, to the deepest depths of darkness accompanied by. Orange. And the tiger's true colors appear in orange, shows no fear. Juices flow in sun bathed bath near the equator's might only in warm weather can an orange tree grow. Orange seeds, I spit seeds instead of spilling seeds that bleed my heart orange. And until the orange is recognized, I will keep wearing a brightly colored color to the love song, sing notes of my favorite color. Orange. To you, I dedicate this poem too. Orange. I'll admit, I'm just a little bit tiny, obsessed with you. Thank you. <clears throat> so this next poem is, is, is a very uh, important series to me. It's a part of a very important series. It's called, uh, it's out of my second book. It's called A uh, Letter to My Son. And it's a dedication to the, um, those who served. Dear son, I know I pushed you to go live with your mother. These streets have nothing for you here. She has asked of me to pay child support, but the way I see it, it's something I owe you. You are my child, and I will always show support. But she keeps making you move to different lands, and how is this letter supposed to reach you in time? I know it seems I pushed you away, but I have loved you since the infancy of your infancy, since when my voice pushed you out of your mother's womb and you certified became an infant. I have loved you from the moment I held you and cradled you in my arms when the first tears of a proud father fell. You didn't have a name then, but you were mine. And I loved you even more since the infancy of your infantry when I gave you back to your mother. The she has raised you under bombs bursting in air and the rockets red glare. Wear pride and strength as your battle armor. A bullet doesn't have the same glory on the battlefield as it does in the streets, but you found that out firsthand. I don't think I could have been a prouder father since I forced you to join the army and serve your mother country. But yet I stand corrected. You have made me prouder. Hey, do you remember when you were a child? I remember. The first thing you did you stole was candy. Well, these people who you are fighting have stolen your time. 
They have stolen you from me, so beat them like I beat you that night. Show them the love that I showed you in the dark nighttime blue. Show them the stars like a boxer who has fallen. And our flag, show them that hope still waves in this vast ocean does. Show them you, my son. Show them you. I want you to read these next few lines carefully, my boy. You better return home. Kick down the door of opportunity if you have to. Open the legs of opportunity and crawl back in. Open the legs of opportunity and crawl back up in your mother's womb of infantry if you have to. And to the brothers and sisters who make, and to the brothers and sisters, make sure you protect them. Tell them to bring you back where the broken, bruised leg cut off, distorted membrane, splatter, I want it all, even the splatter, mental state broken, PTSD ordered, alive or if worse comes to worse, even dead. I say that to say this, I will love you no matter what state you return in. And I will tell you that personally when you come home to me in one piece or in pieces. This is a letter to you, my son, and I hope it reaches you in time before they move you again. And we're back. Okay, wow, that was amazing. So, so a lot of your performance pieces also attract the audience to participate as well. Yes, Right. yes. So as we're talking about that, talk a little bit about some of your media exposure and one of the things that you did do as you started to blossom out with your work. Yes, so A Touch of Orange came out, and then once A Touch of Orange came out, I'm like, okay, this, this is, uh, my poem I wrote I did in high school, this is the stuff I did in college. So I'm just like, all right, what, what do I do next? What is the next step for having these books out? I put them in the bookstores and then all of a sudden, um, maybe around six months ago, I went back to the bookstore and my book had been in the store for maybe about a year at this point, okay. but I was traveling in between, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and I did the book signing. It was an excellent book signing. A lot of my poetry friends came out. A lot of friends in the community came out. They bought my book. And then after, the media hit me up. They, they contacted me one day. It was like, oh, DeMont, we want to interview. We're sorry we couldn't make it out. We want to interview. So when they interviewed me, it was excellent. Everything went well. And the first person, I believe, that interviewed me was the, uh, Kate Needle from mm -hmm. Go Local Providence. And then I had another one hit me up. Go Local Providence, they wanted to interview me. And then um, I have a friend that runs a podcast called uh, What's the Deal, Dale? Dale, he's a comedian. He hit me up and wanted to interview me. Wow. And then uh, I w just recently, as last month, I was back on Go Local, uh, no, not Go Local Providence, uh, with Kate Neagle. Okay. Yeah, it was actually is Go Local Providence. I was back on the show again doing yeah. another interview. So that's maybe four or five interviews and uh, in the span of less than six months. That's amazing. It's amazing. And you've been traveling back and forth as well because you said you were doing some, um, some productions in New York. Yes, yes. 2017 was a very, very big year for me. Uh, when I first started, I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew that I needed to expand not just in Providence, but I wanted to share the community and that's where Orange Live came in. Orange Live is basically my vision for bringing communities together that normally would not be together and representing artists that normally don't have that exposure. Uh, so I went, I contacted Bowery Poetry Club and said, hey, I want to do this. I want to do my thing. I want to do it here. Mm -hmm. I want to do it in Manhattan. I'm from New York. Let's do it. They opened their door to me. They said, DeMont, come through. Let's do it. I, I booked uh, one, uh, I booked a group called Dope Rebel, shout out, Southside Jamaica, Queens, they're from where Ooh. I'm from. Uh, I booked um, Marie Mikael, wonderful, beautiful Haitian author. Wow. She has two books called uh, Say Back To You, mm. and she has another one called uh, Windy Cities of Lust and Desire, and then I also booked um, Queen G. Oh, Queen G, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Amazing, also two books. No, sorry, one book, The Wedding Stone. Mm. Wow. And they both, they all came to New York, and it was a great, 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 great show. Wow. So then I got invited back by by Poetry Club. So once I went back, I said, I have to promote this right. I contacted the seventh annual poetry festival on Governor's Island. I said, I want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I want to sell my books. I went there. Bowery Poetry Club, uh, 
they were a part of that. Mm -hmm. I went to it for the very first time. Never been there. Never been to a governor's island before. Yeah. Did it. It was amazing. It was wonderful. I met a lot of great, great people like Chris, the, uh, Chris the Journey James. He's a big, big guy out in mm -hmm. Atlanta now. Mm -hmm. um, does poetry full time as well. And um, I met a couple of other people from other publishing companies. Promoted. Then had my second event in uh, called Orange Life Part Two, where I brought out uh, Marie Mikael. Again, I brought out Queen G. And then I actually did uh, what is called <coughs> Compassionate Poets. Wow. So the people that you had on um, Orange 2? Orange Live 2, yes. So I had Queen G, I had Marie Mikael come back, wonderful, wonderful Providence-based poets. And then I had what is called Compassionate Poets. They basically go around mass and they help those for um, addicts, oh, help them recover. Yeah. Um, so they, they, they came down and it was such a wonderful blessing for them to come out to my event and uh, it was successful. Wow, wonderful. So I got a big request to come back to Rhode Island. <laughs> so I did Orange Live the Encore. <laughs> I had to come back and, and, and I brought back uh, Compassionate Poets, I brought back, uh, you know, basically the same people. Um, and I stuck with them because they're published they're great, they committed traveling to New York, traveling back in. Um, at the time, I couldn't pay them, so I took them all out to eat after. And then when I was able to pay them, I actually paid them. I'm a big advocate of paying your artists. Right. Which is rare in poetry. <laughs> Very rare, and, and, and acting too. Yeah. Like, my wife, she's an actress, and uh, I, I over 10 years experience in acting, and she still has a hard time, and I know the poets and that does acting as well sure. and, and it's just like take a donation at the door 